Hello, and welcome to the Three Links Oddcast, your podcast for all things having to do with Odd Fellowship. And now, here are your hosts. All right, welcome everyone to the Three Links Oddcast. This is our special second half of our interview with Brother Supreme Page from the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. I'm one of your hosts, Toby Hansen. And I'm Sergio Paredes. And we have our special co-host, Spider Jim. How's it going, y'all? Also known as... <laughs> also known as... Boring old Christopher McHale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that works, too. Before we got cut off by your phone, you were talking about the Moorish Science Temple and how that started in an Odd Fellows Lodge in Chicago. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, the interesting thing, just to clarify, is that one of the heavier guys that was a part of the Moorish Science Temple and helped them to get buildings and start to grow as a, as a collective and build on it as a religion itself was Oscar Stanton, the priest. He was one of he was one of Chicago's top lawyers. He was one of the top African American lawyers out of Chicago, and he was he was really a proponent of how people viewed the Morris Science Temple at large in the Black community. So he was he was actually a really a really heavy guy. I think that he was in the Senate and a few other things as well. Yeah, that that name sounds really familiar to me. If I remember just off the top of my head. I think he was the first African American in Congress after Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Yep. He was the first one elected to Congress in the 20th century. Like, period. Now, I was thinking it was just for Chicago, but actually, period. Wow. And during his three terms, he was the only African American servant in Congress. Yeah, that's really impressive. So, what about uh, other connections between the civil rights movement? and the Grand United Order? Um, there's a few definite ones that I wanted to touch on. One that I had found recently. There's a brother by the name of, I'm looking for him now because I have it in my notes here. I took notes this time. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know before we had mentioned that there were two individuals that actually fought in the Civil War on both sides. One of them was Henry Benjamin Noisette. Okay. He has, he was he was a member of the the first Grand United Order Lodge established in South Carolina. And I remember as I told you that was October of 1865. So it was the same year that the Civil War ended. Yes. He was one of our he was another one of our members that was really heavy. He fought in this he fought in the Civil War. And he was born in 1841, so the start of the Civil War, he was he was still a young man. He was um he worked he was on the S USS Huron, okay, which was known as what they call miracle ships. It was a ninety it was a ship that it was called a ninety day wonder. As a matter of fact, it was basically a lightly armed ship that the Union employed to stop Confederate blockade runners from trading Southern cotton for European war materials. Okay. That was one of the, the main ways in which the South tried to support their war effort is they felt that if they could still trade cotton with Europeans, that they could finance the war and continue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was another one. That was another one. There were just so many brothers, man, like, oh, man, it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. There was a brother by the name of Robert C. DeLarge. He was actually a part of the first colored senators and representatives in the 41st and 42nd Congress of the United States. Okay. So, you know, everybody sees those pictures. Everybody sees those pictures, and it's like like eight or nine, eight or nine African-American gentlemen in suits, and there's maybe four or five of them seated with a couple standing in the back. And, you know... What's important about this guy is that he fought for the Confederacy and later saw the era of his ways with another odd fellow brother that basically came to him like, man, you fought in the Confederacy, man? What the hell, man? Like, you, know, like, you fought for those guys? Like, why would you do that? You know? And 
and you know, he was always he he was a lifelong Republican, but for the most part, he had a little bit of a leg up on most African Americans in South Carolina. He he came from a little bit of money. Ah, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, brother Robert Lamarge. One interesting thing about um, the Civil War is that. For the most part, it was divided up pretty equally along racial lines. But sometimes there were those occasional situations where you had something that didn't quite make sense. Uh, I spent uh, a couple months on the road playing one time with a violinist who was from Tampa, Florida, and she's Jewish. And she told me Mm -hmm. about how in the very small Jewish community that was in the South at the time... There was a lot of discontent about the situation, and it became very fractious where some members of the Jewish community said, we've got to protect our investment here, and they sided with the Confederacy. Some of them said, Mm -hmm. we do not care about our investment here. Um, We think it's better to side with the Union because eventually they will win the war. And, you know, you you look at those things from a modern perspective and you go, well, why wouldn't the Jewish community in the South at the time side with the North? Well, it's because history is more complex than that. It's more about your own individual situation and Mm -hmm. not necessarily about what's going on in an overall sense. I mean, it makes sense. It it makes sense for an individual who studies history, but I know that, you know, One of the things with DeLarge was that even though he was a Republican and for the most part of his career, he was considered a conservative, he was always at odds with South Carolina State Republican Party and rarely defended their corruptness. He was never really just, you know, there for the, he was just never, he wasn't really for the, the extras, I'll call them. That's, that's certainly not unusual in the contemporary world, uh, because you look at uh, the number of Republicans who don't necessarily always agree with the former president, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. They're still Republicans, but they don't necessarily agree with what he had done as president. So again, that's something that we don't necessarily see in history and recognize, but it it's very recognizable in a contemporary situation. One thing that we've always taught is that history repeats itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I I said the same thing about, you know, just all the different parallels with what's going on now versus what used to happen back then. And I mean, it's different, but at the same time, it's not. It's just that there are more eyes now, more eyes and ears to see what's going on. And not just that, it's um, more smartphones out there to record what's going on so that, you know, we get more of a record of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the Grand United Order specifically here. Our mm-hmm. audience is mostly people in the independent order. And of course, you belong to both. Mm-hmm. What would you say are some of the differences between the two? I guess you would have to go back to the way that both orders kind of came about. The Grand United being an amalgamation of 1798 versus, you know, somebody basically breaking away from the order and then, you know, doing their own thing because, you know, at, at in its heyday, there were, I want to say about 30 or 34 odd fellows orders altogether. You know, you had Nottingham, you had a few different ones. You even had different ones within South Carolina, within South Carolina. Like we just found some records for the colored independent society of odd fellows, which I'm sure they broke away from the grand United. Wow. Here, here in District oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of crazy that you know, and I've actually got records of court proceedings where individuals tried to keep the name but not affiliate themselves with the with the larger body. And you know, one of the things that I think is the same but different is that for every state we have a district grand lodge, mm-hmm. as opposed to I guess just having a regular what's considered a regular grand lodge per state. And the numbering, one of the biggest differences that you'll notice between the Grand United and the Independent, one of the first things that I noticed was that when a lodge starts, let's just say in Maryland, 
that lodge usually gets, if it's the only one, that's number one in Maryland, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With the Grand United, what kind of gave us a sense of wholeness is that the dispensations always had to be ran back to England, even though they weren't, it wasn't up to them to approve it. It was up to them to give that lodge a number in accordance with the amount of lodges that were being started anywhere in the world. Okay. So, for oh, example, wow. my lodge is Wayman 1339. That is the third, well, 1,339th lodge in the order, period, all across the world. So you'll never have people that are a part of a lodge number one, and then this is a lodge number one, and then there's a lodge number one here. That's a lot like the uh, Fraternal Order of Eagles. Um, in my area, in Seattle, we have ARE number one, because that's where the Eagles were founded. And then each subsequent ARE that's founded after that gets a higher number. I think Spokane is two, Tacoma is three. Uh, and then, you know, they're like your small town Eagles club out in the mountains is number 2964 because they just kept all of the numbers sequential for all of the clubs rather than renumbering based on what state they were in. Right. That makes sense. So, so yeah, that sense. gave us a sense of wholeness when it comes from, you know, you're like, hey, I'm in a lodge and, you know, my lodge is, you know, the first one here was the Philomathian 646. Just knowing that that was the 646 lodge period in the world, you know, that made everybody feel that sense of brotherhood back when they first started. And speaking of the world, uh, where else would you find lodges of the Grand United Order? Obviously, you've mentioned England, so they're in England, and of course, they're mm, here. In that's the where US. Mother Lodge is. Uh, where else? A lot of. Um, we're in Cuba. We're in most of the Caribbean islands, South America, somewhere down that way. I believe that there used to be lodges, but they they're not. Nobody's heard from them in a while, so. <laughs> We don't quite know what's going on with South America, but I do know that we were in Cuba, we were in Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of the, the, the islands close to each other, they formed their own committee of management back in like 95, I believe. So they have a committee of management, which is, I guess, the next thing we could roll into, which is the power structure for the Grand United Order. That would be great because on the independent order side, we're familiar with local lodges and then district associations and then the grand lodge at the state or provincial level and then sovereign grand lodge. So what's the, the organizational structure of the Grand United Order? Okay, well, you have the committee of management, which consists of nine board members. You have the honorable grand master. That's John Green. You have the Honorable Grand Secretary, and you know, when it, those, those executive positions are pretty much all the same for every organization. We have a Grand Auditor. We have, and when we, when everybody comes together to meet, you know, you have the Committee of Management, and then you also have a body below that, which consists of committees. So you have a historic committee, which I, which I'm co-chairman of, um, along with a sister from now, Alto Roo. She's the other co-chair. That way, we have one male and one female, um, because they have their own history. You know, the household Roo. Um, below them, you have the district grand lodge, and we also have an area. My bad. Yeah, you have an area before you get to the district grand lodge. Now, the area directors basically make sure that the district grand lodges are okay. They don't need anything, any assistance. And we have area meetings, I guess, yearly where they come together in a, in, an, in your area. And it's like four or five states lumped together just to have a little bit of a smaller meeting because we only have the meeting where we all come together. The same way y'all have the sovereign grand lodge session, we have the BMC, which is the biennial conference. So we only meet every two years, but that's like the whole collective. Like usually, you know, the last one we had was in 2018 or 2019, one of the two. And um, we were supposed to actually have one this year, but it got canceled. Well, last year because of COVID. So yeah, it was 2018. All right. And that was a meeting of everybody. Like that's everybody within our jurisdiction. Now, 
When we talk about jurisdiction, the committee of management is over a jurisdiction. So the committee of management includes for American jurisdiction, it includes Canada, it includes the Bahamas, and uh, it used they, they it's it's kind of disputed. They say that Africa used to be under American jurisdiction, but they're not anymore. They they answer directly to England, and they kind of form themselves after England. Other that places, makes more sense. Yeah. England is closer. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot closer than us, right? Yeah, I've been there. I've been to Africa a couple of times. It's, it's it's definitely closer to England. You have to fly to England to get there. So when you mentioned that each each lodge uh, has their historical committee, is that for each individual no, lodge, each, like on the local no, level? That or? was like we have a yeah. Every lodge can have a historian if they if they needed one, you know. Mm -hmm. somebody to document everything that they have going on and, you know, just make note of it so that, you know, they go and they get the secretaries, they can match notes and things of that nature for historical purposes, because the way that we do it, you know, the, the district grand lot is basically in charge of, you know, the district itself for that state and keeping records and making notes of specific things that happen within the lodges that are worthy of note. So I am the district, I'm the district grand historian for South Carolina. I'm also the national grand historian for America and jurisdiction. But uh, as of... It's a lot of writing. Kind of, I guess when I took over, <laughs> man, who are you telling? When I took over the <laughs> job, though, I kind, of, I kind of tilted the focus so that the order could be in better standing than it was when I joined. Because there, I know when I went to the BMC in 2018, we held it in New Orleans. I actually got to go to the Odd Club Cemetery. It was all, it was cool, you know. No, Great place shout, out have brother Mas shout out Brother <laughs> Maslick down there, down there in uh, Waxahachie and a, a few of the other brothers, Brother Freeland overseas. Um, they actually took me to the Odd Club Cemetery. We got to hang out there and it was great. Oh, but cool. while we were there at the BMC, while we were at the BMC though, you know, you have, what's called a past grandmaster's council. They have their meetings. So anybody that, that has those specific degrees, because that's another difference is that our degrees constitute almost everything as far as where you are in the lodge, where you are in your understanding of odd fellowship as in general. Now, when, when you say degrees, is it, are your degrees structured similar to how the independent Order of Odd Fellows has where you have the initiate first, second, and third, or, or do they go by another yeah. name or structure? The first one, the first one is the initiate, but we also call it the white degree. They represent purity. We also have, you know, and from the first three degrees, those are friendship, love, and truth. That's getting you to the basics. And then you have the elected secretary degree, and it goes based on a color. That's why if you notice when you see old pictures that are in color, if any, you know, of the Grand United Order individuals, their aprons, their collars and things of that nature usually match according to their station in the lodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very ornate, very floral. You know, one of our, we had a lot of, it, the Grand United was crazy because it was like, although we had a lot of doctors and lawyers and things of that nature, we also had a lot of men of mark that were artists. And that was one of my things that I thought was really awesome about the order. For example, Patrick Reason, he's one of our founders. His, I mentioned it before. Patrick Reason was actually a, lith, a lithographer, I guess that's how you say it. Mm -hmm. and, he, he, and he was quite famous for it. Um, David Bowser was another artist. He actually painted the picture of Lincoln that is in the White House. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did a lot of lithograph work for a lot of the free African schools in New York and in Pennsylvania. Um, David Bastille Bowser had a, him and his wife had started, uh, they did a whole lot of stuff with William Steele as far as the Underground Railroad was concerned. So it was like they were doing the Underground Railroad thing, freeing people, and still made time to create art and get out here and do the work of abolitionists and try to free the people that were down south that they knew, you know, needed that, needed that extra voice. That, that goes to show you how much that meant to them at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds like they were really driven by purpose. 
it also Mm -hmm. means that you have no excuse for not going to lodge meetings twice a month if they could do Where? all of that, <laughs> sure, that's and, true. And it's like, oh, you know, there's a show on I want to watch tonight. Well, get yeah, yourself yeah. a DVR. It's the 21st century. Go to Lodge. <laughs> right. Go to Lodge. I think that that's important. You know, I I find that in this day and age, even before COVID, men, young men need something of this nature to kind of steer them away from joining groups that ain't necessarily going to do them any, do them any good. You know what I mean? Now, you know, it's, it's like, for example, you got a lot of the gang culture that happened in the United States in the seventies, eighties, nineties on up. I felt like in a way that contributed to the decline in membership and odd fellows or because it was like, well, we could join something else. And, you know, everything lost its zeal. You know, I think that there was a friendly competition between different fraternal orders in membership. That's why they had these big gaudy buildings that, you know, as soon as the membership started to fade, yeah, we, we wound up losing those buildings, you know, because it's like, yeah, you're no, your lodge is no longer a thousand members strong. It's like 10 of y'all. So it's like, yeah, we kind of don't need a, a 15 story <laughs> building anymore downtown on main street by the bank. You know, we had a very, uh, a stark example of that here where I live, Tacoma used to have the world's largest Elks Lodge with over 10,000 members. And my first ever professional gig where I got paid for going out and playing music, I was 16 years old and I played for a retirement party at the Tacoma Elks Lodge. And it was a gigantic recreational complex at 23rd and Union in Tacoma. And Mm -hmm. it, it had a main lodge hall, which was a giant auditorium that had its own organ. They had a 16 piece big band that was still playing for lodge meetings. And this was the, the early nineties. So like that is elaborate. Yeah. And they, yeah. they had these red dinner jackets they wore with ruffled shirts and big bow ties. And mm-hmm. they had, multiple restaurants in this complex they had their own swimming pool they had their own bowling alley in the basement when when we had the numbers for big lodges like that you could have those things but what ultimately Mm -hmm. happened is membership in the tacoma elks really dropped precipitously a few other elks lodges opened up um not too terribly far away and then just the general decline of fraternalism the Tacoma Elks had to sell that complex to Walmart, and it's now a Walmart. Oh, oh my man. God. Uh, yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> There's an oh. elk turning in its grave right now. I, I'm sure there <laughs> is. Oh, man. Every that night at terrible. 11 That's o'clock, terrible, like, oh, no, don't sell the building. <laughs> yeah. As, we, uh, we, we all had the exact same reaction to that. <laughs> yeah, Vile man, that's discontent. terrible, man. I hate it. I hate it. You know, one of the things that I started off doing here in South Carolina, I'm in Columbia, so I'm in the capital city. And one of the first things that I did, I was like, well, there was mention of us having an access to our records. Like, your records are, it was like an, it felt like an Indiana Jones moment. They were like, you know, that somewhere in this small town called Hartsville, your <laughs> records are there <laughs> and you guys should find them. So it's like, okay, well, let me see, where do I start? I reached out to a few professors of African-American history here at USC, um, Dr. Donaldson. Um, I reached out to uh the historical society for my city called Historic Columbia, because one thing that I had always read about the Grand United Order was that they had really gaudy lodges and they had lodges literally everywhere. It was like, it was, it was almost like Walmart. It was like, yeah, you, every neighborhood <laughs> has their own Grand United Lodge. Even on that note, you know, finding my great grandfather in our roster books, you know, it was like they lived on an island. And I'm like, dang, they had a lodge here? There's only like five buildings on the whole entire island. They had a lot, did one of those. They met for lodge there, you know. This was had a household of roof there. But it was like, I went to them first, like, hey, you ever heard of the Grand United Order? And of course, usually when you say Odd Fellows, everybody automatically goes, oh, independent. And I'm like, well, 
No, not quite the independent. There was another group of odd fellas, and you know, they don't want to sound racist and stuff like that. And they're like, Oh, you mean the black odd <laughs> I'm like, Yeah, lo- those guys. Yeah, those guys. <laughs> Heard of them? Any, anything? You know, and most of the time it was like, Well, let's see what we can dig up, you know, and it would be something as small as a name or a short mention in the paper because. At first, I I felt like it was only small mentions in the state newspapers and city newspapers because racism. Yeah. Truth of the matter, what I found out later on as I as I as I started to develop how to look for things, I found out that we had the first black newspaper in my city. So naturally, they weren't going to go to the state newspaper like, please, could you post something about us? Could you put something in the paper for us that we're having a meeting? Didn't need sure. to. Had our own newspaper. All right. Had our own newspapers, you know, and that wasn't just in South Carolina. That was everywhere, man. They had even local new city newspapers. A lot of the first black newspapers were the official organ of the Grand United Order or the Black KLP, Knights of Pythias. Yeah. So that's 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 how everybody got their news, you know. And it just it speaks volumes to the importance that these orders had on our communities because if it wasn't for those things a lot of people wouldn't have gotten news. Well, it's kind of like I mentioned in the the first half of our uh, conversation Mm -hmm. where for the independent order, as civilization moved West across the continents, people relied on the odd fellows for starting civilization. Basically you get a lodge and it means Mm -hmm. you've got a group that can organize a cemetery. You've got a place to have meetings. You've got social Mm -hmm. events that are happening. You got all those things. Well, and that was the, the same with us. Yeah. yeah. For the Grand United Order, you were doing the same thing, except that your frontier wasn't moving west. Your frontier was just bringing people up and getting them into a society that had been closed to them for 250 years. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Indeed. And, you know, somewhere along the line, I feel like the individuals in the Grand United Order earned the respect of the the individuals in the independent order. Now, some independent order brothers were always welcoming and, you know, things of that nature. I mean, there were individuals that were a part of the independent order before the Philomathian brothers joined the Grand United that were like, man, just hold off. There's a couple knuckleheads, but I'm going to try to get y'all in. Just give me a minute. I'm trying to work something here, you know. So you had individuals who were trying to get them into the independent, you know. But, you know, at the time, with the cultural climate that it was, it it, it, it wasn't looking too good. And, you know, it was Peter Ogden that just convinced them, like, listen, I'm a member. I look like you. They don't care about that in England necessarily. So if you just come on and let me sign you guys up, I'm going to go and deliver this personally. Be back in a few months. And, you know, that and it worked out, you know, and, you know, the 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 Grand United was really big in in Australia, too. Really? Now, there's something. Oh, I didn't yeah. Know. We, I had yeah. I actually read I, I, I read I read I read a little I was reading some notes from one of the past grandmasters, you know, from a long time ago in the early 1900s that was talking about how he went and visited Australia and spoke on how it was a beautiful sight that no matter where you go in the world, the Grand United Order of Oddfellows is the same. It's uniform. Hmm. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. That's far stretching, especially around, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, at that time. That was, uh, you know, uh, sending manuals and stuff in the mail. It's going to take you a while and it's going to cost I mean, a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of our, yeah, I mean, one of our district grandmasters here in South Carolina, believe it or not, and, you know, people get the misconception that the Grand United was just an, it was like by blacks, for blacks, and that wasn't actually true. I know one of the earlier Grand Masters here in South Carolina was actually a white guy named C.C. C. Johnson, Charles Catlett Johnson. Wow. And, and as interesting as his story, you know, as, as crazy as this is going to sound, they considered him voluntarily black. Mm hmm. I know you want to ask. I know you want to ask. Voluntarily, <laughs> I just I just want to make sure that I I heard that correct. Did yeah. you say voluntarily yeah. black? Yes. <laughs> it was almost like that thing from the Chappelle Show. You know the dedication <laughs> we want. <laughs> we want to do some trades. <laughs> 
Yes, yes. He was he was voluntarily black. I guess I guess his father has left him and his mom and his sister and his mom wound up marrying a well to do a well to do black fellow from D C. And they went they wound up coming back here to Columbia, South Carolina, and then he was raised as a as a as a black kid. Yep. Wow. He was also the grand ma- he was also one of the earliest grandmasters of Prince Hall here in here in South Carolina as well. And that's another interesting note because we have a very interesting relationship with Prince Hall. Although Prince Hall Freemasonry came out way earlier than we did, the interesting thing was that in the South, for the most part, and for some time, I can't, I'm not going to give any numbers, we were the predominant fraternal organization across the country. Like, we had the numbers. Yeah. A lot of the lodges, for some reason or another, fell out of favor and individuals was like, you know, back then it was like the golden era of fraternalism. It was like, hey, you want to be an elk? They're like, okay, that's my Monday. Sure, I'm going to be an elk. I uh, want to be an odd fellow too? That's your, that's your Tuesdays and Sundays. You know, hey, what about this Freemasonry thing? Yeah, I'm down. <laughs> I'm going to get up in there too. That's my Saturday. You know what I'm saying? And the rest of the time I'm just going to work. You know, His like, must hey, have you weighed a, a ton with all those cards. <laughs> you know, you know, you want to be a squirrel? They like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just all these different organizations. So it was just like individuals. You know, that's where everybody went for entertainment. That's where you went for learning. That's where you went for those connections that they all, you know, that everybody conspiracy theorists think that fraternal organizations have. You know, <laughs> and and with and with good reason for some of that stuff. You know. My favorite conspiracy theory that I've ever heard is that the Freemasons have a secret world headquarters under the new airport in Denver. And wow. Literally the only reason I saw that I saw that because they got a they got some kind of a little display or something at the airport and they're like, yo, yeah. right under this thing. The ma- the mayor the of Denver at the time was a Mason. I I believe mm-hmm. it was Wellington Webb who was mayor at the time. And so, like, commonly happened with all kinds of public buildings for the last 300 years in American history, they would have the local Masonic Lodge come out and lay a cornerstone, okay? Mm -hmm. So, because of that, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theories grew up that the World Masonic Headquarters is underneath the Denver airport. Now, of course, all of us being journalists, we know how ridiculous that is. (laughs) <laughs> but it's it's doubly right. ridiculous if you know anything about masonry because there mm-hmm. is no sovereign grand lodge of the freemasons each grand right. lodge is basically independent there's like mm-hmm. no world headquarters of freemasonry it doesn't exist and the masons who know about the odd fellows having a, a sovereign grand lodge they'll always cluck their tongues and go yeah see that's why odd fellowship is dying they have a worldwide organization to coordinate everything you you can't have that and have a successful fraternal order you know the whole Mm -hmm. idea of a worldwide masonic headquarters is absurd just on itself and then putting it under the airport in denver denver Mm -hmm. really like why that of all places like why denver yeah, it's nothing against Colorado. I mean, it is kind of a central location, but... See, that's why they did it. It's not a, a good conspiracy theory if it's an obvious thing. It has to sound kind of ridiculous. That's why we're all like, ah, no, there's no way that that's true. And th- they're down there laughing, you know, with their stained glass windows. And, uh, you know, we're, right. we're up here like a bunch of suckers. Right. <laughs> If there's anything under the airport in Denver, it's an underused tornado shelter. That's <laughs> that's mm-hmm. it. You know, that's that would mm-hmm. be the only thing. I've flown through the Denver airport, so I, let me tell you something. They are out on the very edge of the Great Plains. They could use a tornado shelter there. So that's probably the only thing underneath that airport. <laughs> So if the uh, safety people from the Denver airport are listening and you'd wind up using our idea, just give us a little plaque or something, and that's cool. <laughs> that's right. That'll be cool. That'll be great. All of us. Supreme, too. He's got to be on it, too. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Put my name on there. Got to be in there, man. 
So I've got one for you. Uh, and I think shoot. with all fraternal organizations, you see kind of an ebb and flow in membership. A lot of them kind of a bit more ebb than flow at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. There has been a huge resurgence in the in the, your order recently. What mm -hmm. What is going on that is making people flock to it at the moment? What are you guys um, getting right? There's a few different there's a few different things to that but i would say the main thing is visibility and an actual need for us i mean i know covid's got us all lonely but one of the things one of the biggest things is visibility i believe and i know with our district grandmaster brother ken uh, he's done phenomenal work as far as getting us a website I mean, even to the point that it got us in trouble with, with the Committee of Management and the Elders, they were a little upset with us about our website because everybody got on our website and was like, man, there's so much information here on www.guoof.org. Just going to plug it. Thank you. Everybody yeah, was just do. like, this has got to be, they're like, this has got to be the national website because you can imagine, and like I said, I'm not trying to take away from the elders and you know, those older guys, you know, they put the in front of everything, so it's the internet, you know, it's, it's the <laughs> Facebook, the Twitter. They're like, I ain't getting on the Twitter. You can't make me get on the Twitter. <laughs> you know, but... But, you know, with us being young and, you know, uh, well, at least younger than them, we were like, man, we have to have a website. We have to take lots of pictures. We have to find our history and really just campaign. I know that when they got started in South Carolina back, I want to say it was 2015. I joined in 2017. There wasn't any, you know, we had a we had a historian, but it was like I spoke to him a few times. It's like, hey, so what are you doing to tell this history? Because our history is 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 big, and it's right here in everybody's face. And it's like we know we know as our fellows about the triumphs of our of our of our predecessors, you know. But the world doesn't know any of this stuff. And, you know, everybody likes something new. And we just like, hey, y'all know anything about the odd toes? They're like, odd toes? The name sounds crazy. What's that? You know? And you just go from there. And it's like, you don't even realize that no matter where you go, you're standing around odd fellows history. Again, you know, that goes back to all of our Grand Lodges and things that had always been on Main Street or right off the yep. Main Street in every city. You know, and it was just, it, it was the building was never... It was never a shoddy or rundown looking building. It was always on the left with every other building, every other bank and, you know, trading companies and things of that nature. So, you know, finding our history was probably the best thing that could have ever happened to us because it gives me an opportunity to sift through it, find interesting stories and tell the world about it. I mean, I pop up everywhere, man. They had a an anniversary for a historic black cemetery here. I popped out. It's like, hey. And they're just like, why is that little dude over there with the three links on his shirt? Why is he telling more than the people who actually put this event on? And I'm like, oh, because I know everybody out here. They're like, what? They're like, what do you mean? You know everybody out here? I'm like, yeah, there's C.C. C. Johnson. There's, you know, James Seabrook. There's, there's uh, Henry Noisette. There's all these different individuals. I'm like, do y'all know who these people are? And they're like, we know exactly who they are. But who are they to you? Why are you here? <laughs> And then when I didn't want to tell them it was my dark side, and then me and my wife like to hang out in cemeteries, they probably didn't hear it. So, you know, yeah. I was like, I know these people, <laughs> and now they're my brothers. Yes, I I oh, can God. feel in my bones the look that someone would give you when you said that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, it didn't take much though. It didn't take much though, just because it was like okay. He's got three links on his shirt. He's standing by a cemetery that has three links at the top of it. <laughs> it's a no brainer. He's like, he must know them or something. He's an undertaker. He's one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, right. You know? You know? So I, I take it the, the Grand United also has a pretty strong connection to cemeteries as well? Mm hmm. A lot of the first African American cemeteries in the South were Oddfellow cemeteries. 
Those were so that was some of the some of the earliest work that the brothers did. It was like, yo, we need to we can just meet at the church. You know, we were a part of the AME connection, Mm -hmm. which was the connection of the first independent black churches in the United States. It was always the AME Zion Church or, you know, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And a lot of our brothers were also pastors and ministers. And if they already had a church, then the brothers would meet at the church, you know, where they used to have their gatherings and stuff like that. I'm still, I want to say that that's where the term fellowship hall comes from, from odd fellowship, but who knows, you know, I haven't had any definitive proof of it, so I don't really put it out there, but that's one of those things, you know, it's just like, you know, if they already had a church and you're, you're, you're a pastor, you know, then you become an odd fellow. The brothers decide, Hey, can we meet here in the basement? And they're like, Hey, you don't have a cemetery. Instead of buying a lodge, let's buy a cemetery. Let's buy a plot of land behind this church or on the side of it or somewhere close to it where our people can be buried, you know, and, uh, you know, not long after that, it was like, okay, we got the burial ground, but people can't afford burial. So it was like, okay, insurance, let's do a burial fund. So we created a burial fund, you know, that was akin to most fraternal organizations at the time. I would also imagine that some members were carpenters too, and they could contribute by making coffins and things like that a lot of the the oldest black continuously running business in the state in the state of south carolina was owned by an odd fellow and it's a, it's a funeral home and that that makes sense because again when you look at the course of black history prior to the civil war there was no civic organization it wasn't allowed and so mm-hmm. after that you have to then establish these elements of civilization for yourselves because of course mm-hmm. after the civil war nobody else wanted to help you out with it even reconstruction so, you went so far right so right. you had you had to get together with these collective organizations and that's really the brilliance mm-hmm. of odd fellowship is it gave the people who needed that kind of community support exactly what they needed if you go back in history mm-hmm. Let's say you go back to the 1840s and you somehow convince the independent order to let black members in at that time. Well, that would have been great in one sense because we all could have been part of the same organization. But in another Mm -hmm. sense, you would not have gotten an organization that was dedicated to just what the black community needed at that time. There you go. So again, that's, that's another aspect of history that can be hard for modern people to really look at at the time Mm -hmm. after the civil war the community needed some kind of homegrown organization that could establish that sense of community that could give groups a place to meet that could aggregate funds for the greater good and that's exactly uh what the grand united or provided totally yeah, that was definitely that was definitely one of the things. I mean, there hasn't been and I'll make the claim and people could call me on it or freak out or whatever. But I will go as far as to make the claim that there is not a single aspect of our history in this country that doesn't have anything to do with the Oddfellows. Nothing. Even if we looked at Martin Luther King, even if we looked at just Martin, simply Martin Luther King and the SNCC, the, you know, they met at they met at the lodge. You know, his grandfather and great grandfather were both odd fellows. They actually helped build up Auburn. The first black pharmacy was right there in the in where the Grand Lodge building was. You know, they added an annex. It was the first black movie theater where black people didn't have to sit on the second row or all the way up in the banister somewhere where people can't see them. Oh wow. It was yeah. the first place where they could, where black people could sit down in the south and watch a movie on the front row. Wow. That's amazing. Another notable is one of our sisters, you know, Madam C.J. Walker. She was a sister in the household of Ruth. Was she? I didn't know that. Yep. That's amazing. Mm hmm. So, with all this knowledge, do you plan on writing a book anytime soon? I, I think you might sell. I'm <laughs> writing it. I'm writing it now. <laughs> I'm uh, writing it awesome. now. It's just like. Just almost like I said about this podcast, like, man, we're going to have to do a third part, a fourth part, a fifth part. 
Oh, that's fine. Just because there's so much, it's like you'd have. I'm. I, we're gonna have to throw darts at a board or something, and you could pick a topic, and I, we could just go on that all night. Yeah. Well, you are definitely a friend of the show, and anytime you can squeeze out a little time for us, we are always happy to sit down and talk with you because you you have access to this huge area of American history that is so underrepresented and so unknown to so many people. I think it's fantastic. And we all on this show love giving you a platform to be able to share that. 100%. Where, uh, what do you see for the future uh, of, your, of the order? The future looks bright for the future looks bright for the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. We are doing a few different things. You can actually go on YouTube and check out a meeting that we had with the district grandmasters from Africa, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and a few members of the Committee of Management here in the United States. It was the first time that some of them had ever talked or spoken. And, you know, via Zoom, baby, got to love the technology. How long ago was that? A couple months. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, I think it's oh, yeah. that the one that uh, Ainsley put up on the Heart and Hand blog. I think so. Yeah, I believe he did. Yeah, I saw part of that. That was really impressive. Mm-hmm. And it, mm-hmm. it goes to show how the wise use of technology can be really beneficial. The example I always think of with this is... If you look at the back of your dues card, if your card comes from a book that's old enough, it has the old telegraph mm-hmm. code on the back. So yeah. you, mm-hmm. instead of revealing any pertinent information to prying eyes, you could send a telegraph or a, a telegram rather to someone's lodge to find out if they were a legitimate member and if you should pay them benefits for the week and things like that. You know, we mm-hmm. we were on the forefront of technology 150 years ago. <laughs> you know, it's like 1871. We're going to find out if this person is actually a legitimate odd fellow. But then we look at it now and people are like, I'm not sure we should be using email for the lodge. That seems dangerous. Can't someone come in and steal everything that way? <laughs> Uh, it's actually really funny. One of the, the my favorite things that I've collected uh, having to do with Odd Fellowship were flyers that were distributed by the Grand Secretary of various states, and they would basically be a picture of a a, a person, and it would be claiming that this person w- was a fraud that they had tried to come into an Odd Fellows lodge and said he was a member of Lodge so and so, and it ju- it was just. Uh, this amazing little piece of history that most of them are from the twenties to the forties type of thing. Uh, but I, I mean, it, it's amazing that we were that important that at one point you would uh, potentially defraud people by saying, Oh yeah, I'm an odd fellow. Yeah. Like that, that would make sense as a scam, you know, <laughs> Not, now you'd say I'm an, an odd fellow and someone would say, well, you're a what? Yeah. You're a, yeah. You're I know who? you're odd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, leave, leave me a. Is that another word for a homeless person? Or, <laughs> oh, maybe well, not. Well, Brother Supreme, know. what else would you like to grace us with while we're recording here? Man, there's too many things that I could touch on. You know, as far as the order is concerned, one of the more interesting things I know that you know I talked with Brother Louis Sarmiento about, and me and Jimmy talked about it was why it is that we can't officially just amalgamate back into one order is because of the difference in degree work. I know we have a, I think we have a few more degrees than you guys. I know just in your lodge itself, I think we can go up to seven degrees and then you can get household or roof degrees. You can get, we have a military branch as well, similar to the Patriarch's militant. And we also have, and you know, it's all degrees, you know, as you go into these different branches of the order, we had a juvenile society and things of that nature. But one of the differences is that, yeah, we basically got more degrees than you guys. Like I know y'all go from friendship, love and truth and kind of put it there as far as lodge participation. And we, we have a lot of degrees and, you know, there was a purpose for having these different degrees 
And the beauty of it is that with the brothers in America joining the Grand United Order, we actually started the female branch. There was no household of Ruth in England. And not only did they allow these individuals who some people didn't think of as anything more than animals to join their order, but they actually were open to input and open to developing the order into what it is today and helping it to spread all over the world. Yeah, I I think that owes to the, the cultural shift that happened in the UK a lot earlier than it did in America, because in the UK, slavery was outlawed by 1802, and that was because mm-hmm. of several years of work by abolitionists in the UK. And so they just mm-hmm. they said, nope, that's it. We're done. We're leaving it behind. Whereas uh, mm-hmm. America and a lot of places in the Western Hemisphere, you know, it's true in Brazil. It's true in a lot of former Spanish colonial places. They did not want to give up on the idea of humans as a source of free labor. They just they could not conceive of that. And so that cultural shift took a lot longer to happen in other places. One really good example of that uh, is the Haitian Revolution. You know, the French actually went to Haiti after declaring the slaves free, and then they showed up again six months later and said, oh, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. You're slaves again. (laughs) Yeah, that did not go over well with the Haitians. (laughs) And just kind of that idea, it takes a lot to be able to move away from that and to embrace an idea that does not include different levels of human existence. So I think in the UK, they probably came to that realization a lot sooner. And so it was easier for the Grand United Order to be able to look at that and say, oh, you know what? That makes sense. Let's give something for the women so that they can be invested in this group too. Uh, So one last question, home fries or French fries? French fries. And uh, what, what kind of French fries? Like what format? Mm. Me? Cause you got, you got like, Oh yes. All All right. Me, right. cur- oh, I'll even go. I'll even go you one better because I don't know how it's happening in other regions. Nacho fries. Oh, that sounds good. Mm. Oh my God, Taco Bell is doing a thing, <laughs> and they are on it. <laughs> There's so much that unites us as people, and Taco Bell is one of those things. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. it, it most definitely is is of the utmost importance that everybody can be united through food, you know. Everybody <laughs> likes food. Few things that, that we all have in common. It's like, yeah, well, I got to eat. One of the best sure. things um, for me about traveling is I get to try different stuff. When I went to Sovereign Grand Lodge in North Carolina last, uh, two years ago now, in 2019, um, every day for lunch, my friend Greg and I, Uh, We would go to a different place around Winston-Salem for lunch. Mm -hmm. I I had more incredible food that week than I I think I did in any other year of my entire life. Great barbecue places and and different styles. Because as you know, being down Mm -hmm. in South Carolina, you go 50 miles and it's a slightly different kind of barbecue. So we had different kinds Mm -hmm. of barbecue um, some of the best fried chicken I've ever had in my entire life oh, at Miss God. Aura's, which is like two blocks down the street from the Sovereign Grand Lodge office. Um, we went to this one brew pub there that had these incredible burgers. Just the whole thing. I would have gone to Winston-Salem just to eat. It was a bonus that Sovereign Grand Lodge was happening at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, I feel the same way about Memphis. That sounds like an amazing weekend of eating. Whereas when you came to the Grand Lodge of Montana, we <laughs> went to Golden Corral. And I and I don't know about you, but eating at Golden Corral before a, like a, a large meeting is just a terrible idea anyway. Uh, I think that that may have actually been the one first down time. South, man. Oh, Yes. Well, well, here's the thing. So uh, 
I think it may have actually been the first time that I had eaten at Golden Corral, and maybe I was just exceptionally hungry. But I know uh, their all-you-can-eat uh, policy immediately becomes a challenge of some variety when you're a man. And I seriously ate a probably like the weight of like a medium-sized Golden Shepherd. And I had to sit in a meeting afterwards and uh i was sweating and i just i felt horrible i i seriously wanted to crawl under the table and die like as we were appointing the new uh, grand master of the state it was oh my god it was touch and go i i i didn't know whether i was gonna i i didn't think i would make it i didn't think i'd make it i thought i was gonna die oh, oh man I think that I, down south, man, I don't know, man. The food is definitely different, per se. Me being, you, you can I say grew up better. In That's DC, okay. So you can say I grew better. up in D.C., so we, but see, I had my own premises. Anything that came out of the water, I would eat it. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, once Baltimore I got crabs. down south and people, yeah, you know, and once you get down south and people start to really, they put a different, a different love on the food in the south you know yeah. what i mean and it's like it's like no other like i can't think of any other place where if you don't get anything out of the south you get fed <laughs> yes i i can attest to that because on the way home from uh winston-salem we had to fly out of greensboro and there was a direct flight from charlotte to seattle so we fly to mm -hmm. charlotte we get there terrible thunderstorms uh, like happens a lot in the South in the summertime. And so we were stranded Beautiful, a day though. in Charlotte. I got to go to Mert Soul Food in downtown Charlotte and have the smothered pork chops. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's, that is like a legendary place in that area. And I had no clue. You know, we, uh, me and my buddy Greg, we happen to, you know, we're looking for stuff to do. We go to a museum downtown and, then we're like, oh, we need dinner before we go to the airport. And around the corner is this restaurant. We walk in there um, and the food was just amazing. And then come to find out um, all the, the big national touring acts that go through Charlotte usually request dinner from Mertz to be brought over to the arena or the stadium or the theater, wherever they're doing their show. So we, we happened to luck into one of the best spots in town for that. Would when Def Leppard is in town, they only want to eat at Mertz. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, that's usually how it is, too. It's always some hole-in-the-wall joint or some place that's just, like, has phenomenal food and the history to match. I kind of like where the, where the food industry is going these days. We have a lot of real new startups here in South Carolina that are really just they're – go, they're going crazy with the food, man. They're putting new spins on old meals and old dishes. I mean, like, I'd hate to say, I'd hate to brag, but it's just like, man, the South got even better. <laughs> oh, go I, ahead I, and brag. I, You've earned it. I feel like I've always missed <laughs> yeah, out on man. seafood because I'm allergic, but oh, I knew no. a guy. Oh, yeah. God. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. You seafood, need... that is terrible. I, I am like, I would just do it, man. Just get, EpiPen, just get an EpiPen, man, and do it, man. Just do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've always liked living on the other side of the track, so I might just risk it one of these days anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, man, it's worth it. <laughs> I, I, you know, there there are some seafood things that I've always wanted to try. But uh, what back when I was in the Navy, I knew a guy with such a bad case of crabs, I called him the governor of Maryland. <laughs> uh, hopefully he's not listening <laughs> oh man <laughs> yeah man you got anything else you want to share with us before we wrap it up here I don't even want to get started in anything else because man <laughs> listen like I said We'll save I have it to for, save for, for part, part three. three, four, five. Yeah. But, well, you, but I do you appreciate know, you guys. I do appreciate song. you guys. One thing that one thing that is really great with today's society that probably did exist then, but it's being amplified now is the relationship between our orders. You know, even though I'm a double R, so I'm in both. 
but the, the, it's it's a lot to it, man. It's a lot. It's it's a beautiful thing to see individuals like again Jimmy, you know, that decided to take it upon himself to not only plug me in with the Grand United, but he plugged me in with the Independent too, and then joined my lodge, you know, and. I, I like I said I talked to him maybe a week almost a week ago and you know he's doing good and he actually started a couple of independent lodges in Georgia that are predominantly brothers you know <laughs> and and they're doing great work in Atlanta man they are and it's it's wonderful to see the resurgence <laughs> of odd fellowship of all kinds because exactly. You know, the, the South has been an area where Odd Fellowship has really faded away so much. And to see the growth that has come out of the South, a new lodge in Virginia last year, uh, a couple of new lodges in Louisiana last year, uh, and then a couple of years before that, the new lodges in Georgia, people are, they are really getting the message that Odd Fellowship strengthens their communities and it gives them an opportunity to be a part of something really, really great. One of these things that we kind of preach too about individuals coming into the order is that our sole purpose is not necessarily taking care of the community because that's a niche that we've always filled. And now I feel like it's the time for the odd fellows of both orders to realize that the strength of our orders is in each other and yes. what we could do for each other. It's not just a thing of giving any individual, you know, a leg up or, Hey, we did the most with the community or we did this or we did that because, you know, sometimes a brother just needs to hear from somebody who actually cares about him. And that'd be the difference between him going off the deep end and doing something to hurt himself versus, you know, continuing to say hey it's not that bad i do have my large brothers there for me because for some of us that's all we have yep that's the truth i don't think you could have said that any better i want to thank you for being so free and giving with your time brother supreme you are a real treasure of odd fellowship and on behalf of all of us here we want to thank you for joining us on the three links oddcast and next time awesome. you got something you want to send out to the world, be sure and let us know because uh, we will happily put you on, uh, you know, whenever we can find the time. If you got that book coming out, we'd love to have you. Man, yeah, I got a couple books coming up. I'm actually working on one that's called My Brother, Can You Keep a Secret? And, I, and it's kind of funny because I have to keep changing the year because it's like I started when I started, it was 176 years of the Grand United in America. And now it's like 137, 178 by yeah. March. So I'm going to have to keep changing my book cover. Oh, well, there's your incentive <laughs> to get it done. Absolutely, man. But we are definitely going to get back together and, you know, talk some more about these orders and see what we can do to get the younger generations completely involved, you know, and kind of just start – blending i should say you are doing some fantastic work there my job's never done <laughs> yeah. oh it's never done for any of us thank you so much for joining us uh we all really appreciate all of your efforts and uh mm -hmm. normally at the end of an episode we do something called the odd pod where you get to brag about something that you've done that isn't necessarily related to odd fellowship so if you got something you want to share, now is the time to do it. Well, outside of our fellowship, man, I'm taking care of my household, uh, raising a daughter that's 12 going on 20. Um, <laughs> I've raised daughters, I understand. Know, and, that is, and that is a full-time job in itself. Um, and, you know, just... Keeping the brothers together, man. I mean, most of the people that work at, work for me at Diamond Cut Tattoo Company, you know, they're also brothers in their order. You know, we meet at the tattoo shop, so I see the brothers all the time, and they're always doing great work and just different things because one cool thing about the odd fellows is not having to go through the chain of command to do something that would be in the spirit of odd fellowship. So, you know, shout out Wayman Lodge 1339. District 13, the brothers in Georgia, District 18, 
and all the brothers of the Grand United all across America and out throughout the world. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Brother Christopher, anything you want to add here? So I uh, received issue number three of Ghost Watch Photozine in yeah. the mail the other day. Uh, it is a, an issue having to do with local lore. It is absolutely fantastic if you're into spooky stuff. Uh, I wrote a, a piece for Ghost Watch Photozine. Uh, I, I sent it to you, Toby. You, you read it and you- I liked uh, it. It's very good. Thank you very much. It was deemed so horrible <laughs> that it was uh, its its release has been delayed a couple of issues, but I believe it's issue five that that one is coming out in. So uh, you can look him up on Instagram at uh, Ghost Watch, but the O in Ghost is a zero. Ooh. And uh, if you're if you're in, yeah, I know. Yeah, we, we went through this because the Ghost Watch is probably like a Korean pop band. <laughs> That, that has like 14 million followers and he's like darn i can't have that one uh but anyway you can get in touch with him and you can get this thing it's totally free uh he'll send it to you and if, if you're into spooky stuff which obviously we all kind of are into the a little bit weird stuff uh oh yeah check it out it's, it's definitely worth it it's pretty cool all right sergio you got anything you want to share uh no not not really the only thing is uh my lodge la 35 uh, los angeles golden rule 35 is planning on having a uh open zoom meeting hopefully next month so i would be posting that on our facebook and social media so pretty much you don't have to be in la county los angeles county or southern california though that's the target audience so but anybody come down from bakersfield is that what you're telling me Sure. Anybody who has a computer and an internet, drop on down, say hello, ask your Just questions. Just as long as they're not from Sacramento. Oh! oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, <in> Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now it's it. getting testy up in here with all the Californians. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Well, I was called Dower on a previous episode, so I've got to up my game a little bit. I have to, uh, I have to poke the fire a little bit. Oh, uh, that explains the handlebar mustache you're rocking about. today. Oh no, I, I, this That's is a lifestyle, my about. man. This is yeah. a lifestyle. <laughs> How very Chester Allen Arthur of you. It's a Spider Jim, actually. Spider Jim. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm a biker tattoo artist. <laughs> nice yeah i i won't let in on your secret that you actually ride a vespa <laughs> brother can you keep a secret <laughs> yes vespa is not a bike bro <laughs> hey i i will have you know that it is 150 cc's of handmade italian sex appeal <laughs> I totally agree. We 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 know that. I feel yeah. you feel you feel a lot of these kids out here with those things. Yeah, you gotta go a little harder, man. We're in the south, man. It's like there are kids riding around out here or or on on bikes bigger than that, man. And like at like uh, five I, and six, man, you'd be surprised in these dirt roads. So I was riding around uh, on the the coast of North Carolina last year. And you would be amazed how hard everyone thought I was. <laughs> you might yell at me out your car window and, and call me, a, uh, I don't know, a weird bastard or something like that. But as soon as we pull up to the red light next to each other, it's over, man. It's over. You're going to, you're going to, uh, you know. That's when they fall in love with you. <laughs> Well, yeah, as long as that. you didn't cross, as long as you didn't cross over down by Myrtle Beach or anything like that, man, them Hell's Angels might have got at you. <laughs> well, yeah, they'd be getting at me. They'd be, uh, you know, telling me to pull over so they could say, "Hey, you know, how do we uh, get you to sign up?" And I'll say, "Listen, guys, <laughs> I, I, I uh, they'd be like, I hey, man, put this on. patch on. <laughs> put this patch on, man. Yeah." And I'll, and, and I'll say, listen, you got to sell it to me. And meet why do, at church. You got to come to church. Why do I want to join the Hell's Angels? You tell me. <laughs> yeah, do they have cemeteries? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Right. Well, they have cemeteries of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are in yeah. cemeteries. 
They're, they're some of them, you don't know where that. they're buried. <laughs> yeah. Future future historians will discover those. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that under the blockbuster, they sound like I want to dead people? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> well, in that case, under the blockbuster is buried the other blockbusters because those are dying <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a mini blockbuster. It's down there with the Woolworths. <laughs> <laughs> mm hmm. Uh, here's one you haven't heard. Believe of Believe it or not, time. there's actually an underground. There's actually an underground in Columbia, though. There's actually there was an underground like arcade kind of mall under the streets of Columbia, South Carolina. That's an interesting little tidbit. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would go to that. Yeah, there's a couple of entrances that they tried to block it all off and stuff. It's one of those funny, fun adventures that you do, just like what you were saying about that other, uh, the other thing you were writing for. Um, we actually have I, this insane. The sanitarium here was probably the second oldest in America. And yeah, we did that one. We did that for my wife's birthday right around Halloween one year where we just, you know, did a few, did, did a little trespass in per se, but we just call it for now. <laughs> You know, the crazy thing was we went in for a while and we took a bunch of pictures and stuff and it's pitch dark in there. And then we took a group photo in front of a mirror. And when we got the pictures developed, there was an extra person in the, in the, in the picture. Ooh. Oh, sanitarium. <laughs> yeah. Me, yeah, me. man. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Well, we should wrap this up here. Thank you so much for joining Wait. us, Brother Supreme. It has been fantastic. We all appreciate what you're doing there in South Carolina and uh, just reviving odd fellowship with everything. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you for listening, everyone.